Now look, recently Pastor Kevin preached a sermon on betrayal. Um, this sermon's going to have a little bit of crossover with that, but it is a different sermon. Um, I'm preaching on, today I'm going to be preaching on resilience, or basically the title of the sermon is Developing a Thick Skin. Developing a Thick Skin. Now, I believe this characteristic for a Christian is vitally important. If you want to be effective for the Lord, if you want to be productive for the Lord, this is a char- characteristic that you must develop. And the reason I say this, if you quickly turn over to Matthew chapter 13, now this is a parable that we're all familiar with, the parable of the sower, but there's one part of this parable that I want to focus on as to why it's so important for us to be resilient. And in Matthew chapter 13, if we start in verse 18, this is the parable of the sower. Now for those that might not be familiar with this parable, basically it's a parable about a sower that goes forth sowing seed, which represents the word of God. And that seed falls on four different locations. There's, there's the seed that falls by the wayside. There's the seed that falls on the stony places. There's the seed that falls amongst the thorns. And then there's also the seed that falls on good soil. And in Matthew 13, in verse 18, it reads, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, verse 21, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Now this is is the aspect of the parable that I want to focus on today, and the reason why this is a vitally important characteristic that we have because offences will come. They're going to come. Now, now look, even aside from the Bible, aside from the Word of God, offences will come in this life, just in g- generally speaking, even not just for the Word of God, but just in general, offences are going to come. People are going to offend you. And if you've got a thick skin, if you are resilient, it's not going to distract you. It's not going to be something that consumes you. It's not something that's going to overtake your life. You're not going to be so offended that you become completely bitter towards people and it becomes like, a, it, it chokes you. It will, it will destroy your life. And in fact, in this parable, Jesus makes it clear that it's only the seed that falls on the good soil where there's fruit being produced. It's that you've got to be in that good soil, receive the, the seed, the Word of God, to produce something for the Lord, some 30, some 60, some, some 100 fold. So those that are easily offended on that stony ground, the, the Bible's clear, they're not going to be productive for the Lord, they're not going to be producing fruit for the Lord, they're too easily offended. Now today we live in a generation full of what I would call snowflakes, like this is a popular term given today, particularly this, this new generation, and they're just so easily offended by things that aren't even relevant in their own lives. They, they become offended because somebody else was offended, let alone they themselves being offended. Right? And this is the world that we live in. And we don't want to be like that. We do not want to have a victim mentality as a believer. And we can see there that if you, if you are easily offended, you're not going to be productive for the Lord. Now, I, I don't normally preach or share a lot about my own personal experiences from behind the pulpit. But I think this is one of those sorts of sermons where I'm going to share some personal experiences some things that I've been through personally since I was saved about eight years ago. And I think the Lord just wanted me to go through some really rough experiences early on in my faith as a young believer so that I would learn things quickly and learn to be resilient. Now, look, I'm not going to say that I'm super resilient or that I've got a really thick skin. I'm a work in progress, okay? My feelings still get hurt. I still take things personally, I'm human just like you, but I'm definitely a lot better than I was eight years ago when I was just newly saved. And, and, and what I want to share about is shortly after I was saved, obviously I'd received the knowledge of the truth, I'd accepted the gospel, I'd received the free gift of eternal life, I was excited. You know, like Jesus talks about receiving that w- with joy, right, here, right? Now, thankfully, I didn't end up being, I don't believe it, so anyway, that person that's, you know, the, the seed's fallen on the stony path. I have been productive for the Lord. I go out soul winning, you know, I, I preach the gospel. I haven't allowed persecution or hardships to stop me from doing that. 
but there's still so much to learn. But, but having said that, these experiences I had early on, shortly after I was saved, I was craving fellowship. I needed to find a church at the time. I was desperate to find a good church. Now, our church, New Life Baptist Church, has only been around for four years. So this was about four years before New Life Baptist Church started on the coast and Pastor Kevin moved up here. And I had a great amount of difficulty finding a good church. So a church that, you know, just used the King James Bible, preached the gospel clear, didn't muddy the waters and went out soul winning. That was, that was sort of the criteria I was looking for in a church. And in that journey, I actually encountered some of you that are here today and others that aren't here today. And what I want to talk about is th there was about three or four of us that we were meeting up about four years ago. These were people that I'd sort of encountered along the way, either through social media or somebody else recommending them. This was after I was short, shortly after I was saved because I was starving for fellowship and I was keen to preach the gospel. Like I just wanted to share this great news with everybody because it's just so easy to be saved. Like I'd come from a background where I was believing in a works-based salvation. I'd been in a church that was hardcore work salvation for more than eight years and it was just such a weight off my shoulders and I was like, wow, this is so easy. Surely everyone's going to receive this good news, you know, if I just go out there and preach the, the news of the gospel. And one of the first things I did was go back to my old church and give them the good news, right? <laughs> Thinking, oh yeah, I, I got saved. I believe the gospel. Surely they're going to receive it, right? No. <laughs> in fact, I would say 98% of them rejected it and hated me even, they hated me more. They hated me more. I'd already left the church. They probably had some ill feeling toward me already and this just made it worse, Right? Because they think they're right. They think it's, you know, it's more than just faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. But I was on this journey that, you know, and of course, naturally, you, you, you want your family to be saved as well. And I'm trying to get my family saved and trying to get them converted. I needed some friends, right? I needed some like-minded believers around me. I was desperate for fellowship. I was desperate to get other people converted because I wanted like-minded believers around me. Now, of course, th these men that I'm talking about, one of them was actually responsible, well, largely in part, for getting Pastor Kevin to move up to the coast and start New Life Baptist Church. And he's not here with us today. And the reason I'm going to share this is because I believe he's somebody that's on that stony path. This is an example of somebody where the, the seed's sown, he receives it with joy, but can't handle the hardships, the persecution, the tribulation. Just can't handle it. Um, too thin-skinned, not resilient. Why, why is it? Why is it that some people can learn to become resilient and others just want to be the victim and just play the victim mentality and, you know, woe is me, the world is against me kind of attitude? And this is what we're looking at today and I believe this is why this is so vitally important. Now, unfortunately for this individual today, he's not here with us today. Now, that's not to say that this is the only church or he should be here or he has to be here. It's not like that at all. But I can tell you now he's not in a good place spiritually. He's in a bad place. This can happen to anyone. This can happen to any one of us. And we want to be guarded against this. We don't want this to happen to us because like I said, you are going to face persecution. You're going to face tribulation, especially as believers. Now, you can be bullied in this life for not even believing the Bible, right? Like, like I said, life has the rough and tumble. There are things that happen in our lives and they make us who we are today. But when it comes to persecution for the Word of God, and what the Word of God teaches and trusting in Jesus, that can take it to a whole new level. You know, family, friends that you have, people that you know, they, we've just read from Matthew 20, 26 where Jesus is betrayed. People can betray you. You know, pastor preached on this. And the thing is, it's not a betrayal unless they're your friend, right? It's only your friends that can betray you. And that's why it hurts so much because it's usually people that are close to you that can betray you. And we need to prepare ourselves for this kind of thing. You need to be prepared for this. There's no point in trying to avoid it. Like there are people that try and avoid this sort of stuff. They try and make themselves look good to other people. You know, they try and make Christianity look good. They try and polish it and because they don't want to be persecuted. They don't want to suffer any tribulation. So they water things down a little bit. They might, you know, especially on certain topics in the Bible, right? Avoid certain touchy issues. Now, speaking about this individual that's not here today, one of the sort of the touchy sort of subjects for this particular, and it could be a number of different topics for different people, but for him it was the Jews. It was specifically the Jews and the Sodomites. 
And he got his back up and got super upset about anything that touched on these particular topics in the Bible, right? Now, we don't want to fall into that trap, but there are some people that they invest their time, their energy and their efforts into the wrong things, into the wrong sort of things. And when somebody pokes and prods at something that's a little bit sensitive for them, they get their back up, they get offended, they get upset because they're not invested in this properly. They're invested in something else that conflicts with the Word of God. And that's often why they'll get offended or they'll get their back up and get upset about things that they shouldn't be getting upset about. Now look, I'm the same. I can get this way too. I can be upset or get aggravated about things that hit close to home. I think we all can and I think we can all relate to that. But in this situation, I had these three guys that I thought were all like-minded and, you know, believed the same as me about the gospel. And we even went out soul winning together. This was four years before New Life Baptist started. Uh, One of these individuals I did quite a bit of soul winning with for probably a couple of years. And it, it just boggles my mind why he would allow these sorts of things to get him so upset. You know, and he has some Jewish background claims to have some, some Jewish blood. And so he's heavily invested in this, right? This, the wrong thing. The Bible says avoid genealogies, right? right? Now, if you're invested in this correctly, you're not going to get offended about something trivial like that because the Bible's commanding avoid genealogies. He failed to do that, right? He failed to avoid these genealogies. Now, developing a thick skin, it, when it comes to the Word of God, you have to be sold out. What I mean by that is you believe and trust and hinge every belief system you have is fully invested in God's Word. His teachings, His doctrines, everything. To the point where you're not worried about offending other people. Now, you're not trying to offend other people. You're not looking for it. That's not the goal. But I promise you, if you're a believer and you are 100% invested in this and you fully trust this, believe it and hold, hold it fast, you're going to wind up in situations where you're going to offend people by the things you say. Because not everybody that claims the name of Christ is fully on board with the doctrines that are actually taught in the Bible. Sometimes they're ignorant, other times they're not ignorant, but they just have their own biases and they can't see past that because they don't like it. They simply just don't like what the truth might be teaching. Now, if we look at, let's have a look at, um, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Because Paul, the Apostle Paul, had his own troubles with certain people. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 26... He's describing some things that were happening to him and he says, In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils by the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. You know, our lives might not be as perilous (laughs) as what the Apostle Paul was. He had a a perilous life. Like, he was constantly in danger Um, In Australia, we don't really have this kind of environment, this kind of severe persecution. That's not to say that it couldn't come in the future and we need to be prepared for it. But on a smaller level, just in our own personal lives, we can have these sorts of experiences with people around us, whether it's family, close friends, work colleagues. The workplace is an interesting one because there's a place where you can't avoid it. You're working with the same people day in, day out, and you can end up with people that hate your guts because you believe this, right? Some people might just hate you just because they just don't like you. That's, that's another story. But there are people that will hate you for your belief system, right? And in the workplace, it's not like you can suddenly just make the decision, oh, I won't see this person again. They're there the next day, day after, day after. And this is where developing a thick skin becomes really important. Having some, some resilience so that you can weather the storm, right, in your life. And when you, here's the thing, when you see people that hop from job to job, quite often it's because they encounter people that they can't get along with. And so instead of learning to cope with it and becoming more resilient 
and just becoming a stronger individual and, ha and developing that thick skin, like, ah, oh, these are too hard, I'll just go to another job. I'll get another boss. I'll get another... Now, look, there, there are probably some situations and circumstances where it's warranted and you probably should do it. But nine times out of ten, no, it probably isn't. It just got all too hard and, no, I'm too thin-skinned and this is too rough, I'm, I'm out of here sort of thing. You know, and you look at what the apostles went through in the book of Acts and, boy, howdy, did they have some... develop some resilience, right? They certainly developed some, some resilience and they didn't stop, they didn't give up. It's like, ah, oh, it's all too hard, it's too hard, I, I'm too offended. Look at what these people are saying about me. No, they, they just kept going and they developed some super resilience along the way. Now, if we, if we have a look at Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah chapter 17, because obviously we want to we wanna be blessed by the Lord And the Bible is full of teachings on what it means to, you know, trust in the Lord and what the result will be. And if you don't trust in the Lord and trust in man. Now, something that's common amongst people that are sort of easily offended, they tend to be the sort of people that look up to man. They look up to men. They put men up on a pedestal or they have certain expectations of other people. And of course, those people don't meet those expectations and so they're offended but the Bible uses some really strong language in Jeremiah 17 when it talks about who we're trusting. And in Jeremiah 17 verse 5, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, so, so, saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord, for he shall be like the, the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. But in verse 7, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. And when you look in the book of Acts at the apostles and, and what they did and the fruit that they produced for the Lord, you, we see this playing out. They did not put their trust in man. Their trust was in the Lord and despite the persecution, despite the hardships, they are like this tree planted by the waters, by the river, right? They're flourishing. They're producing fruit. They're, they're seeing souls saved. They're accomplishing amazing things for the Lord and this is why it's just so critically important that we learn to be resilient, that we, we develop this, this thick skin. And it's done by putting all of our trust in this. Not compromising, not watering it down to try and make it look more polished and appealing to people. Look, at the end of the day, you can't. You, you, you cannot make this look good to somebody that hates God or somebody that just wants to persecute you and hate you for, because you believe in Jesus. It's, it just can't be done. And there's people that are critical of some pastors because they preach the Word of God really hard, boldly. They go to parts of the Bible that people don't like, like Genesis 19, whatever it might be, and people just want to block their ears. Or they want to say things like, you're making, you know, you're, you're not, you know, representing Christ in a really good way here. You're somehow, you know, making Him look bad by simply preaching the truth of the Word. It's ridiculous. But it happens. Because these people are thin-skinned. They're thin-skinned. Now, let's have a look at Jesus. We're going to look at Jesus here. And in John chapter 2, we're going to see Jesus' attitude towards men when it comes to trust. John chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, because Jesus knows men inside out, back to front, he knows us, he knows our sins, he knows our agendas, our motives, he puts no trust in man, right? None. He doesn't commit himself to us in that regard. And we should have the same attitude. Now, it's not, it's not unloving. It's not unloving to not put your trust in others. It's a smart and wise thing to do. And in fact, 
In Matthew 10, verse 16, Jesus says this. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You see, when there's sheep among the wolves, when the sheep doesn't have a shepherd and they're amongst the wolves, they're in real trouble, right? <laughs> like if they're not close to the shepherd and the wolves are surrounding them, they're in some real strife. And, and Jesus wants us to be smart. He doesn't want us to be silly. He doesn't want us to deliberately put ourselves in harm's way. You know, it's, there's no point in just putting yourself in harm's way because you want to develop a thick skin or <laughs> become more resilient, right? Where we can avoid bad situations, we should. And, and this is why Jesus gives us this advice. So wisdom is required, right? But he also says harmless. Now, when these people persecute you, give you a hard time, desert you, betray you, um, don't want to know you anymore, say bad things about you. Now, I had this happen, these, these guys that I'm talking about. Um, in that situation, they started saying a lot of things about me to a lot of other people that were just not true. Now, some of it was true, but the way they would talk about it or say it or divulge it to other people, it was like I'm this wicked, evil... Per- you, you're going to have false witnesses that are going to testify against you in this life. They're going to say things about you that are untrue. They're going to try and paint you in a bad light. And here Jesus says, be harmless as doves. It's not our job to try and right the wrongs and fix things or, man, I want to keep a good name, so I better go and tell everybody everything that really happened. We shouldn't be like that. It's not necessarily. The Lord knows the truth. He knows what's happened. He knows what really was said or what was not said. That's more important. That's more important and that will help you have a thick skin. It'll help you be resilient because when you don't care about what people say about you behind your back or, you know, in the workplace seems to be a classic place where these sorts of things happen because in the workplace, as you can imagine, you tend to have people that want to take other people's positions and climb the corporate ladder and, you know, some people will do anything. They'll say anything about you behind your back to try and make you look bad or shed a bad light on you. Now, all the more, if you're a believer they're going to try and use that as leverage against you somehow as well. And you think about how critical people can be of of us because the the expectation that's often there as believers, right? Like, (laughs) we're sinners just like them, but quite often their expectations can be right up here because we're Christians, right? We've got a reputation to uphold. So wisdom's required. Now, when you think about this, if... If you, as a person, if you didn't have any feelings, you know, if you didn't feel any pain, feel any hurt, you wouldn't need to be resilient. You wouldn't need to have, you know, a thick, a thick skin, right? You wouldn't need it because your feelings can't be hurt. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to contrast this with, we're going to look at the reprobates for a, for a second here and we're going to look at what is it about the reprobates? Do they, do they have a thick skin? Do the reprobates have a thick skin? And I'm going to say no, because as far as their feelings are concerned, they, you know, they they can't really be hurt in the same way that we can, right? As far as the conscience is concerned as well. And in Jude 12, concerning the reprobates, it says, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, um, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Romans one thirty one. without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. These people, the Bible describes them as being handed over to that reprobate mind. Their mind is warped, right? They have no empathy, right? So they can have sort of this appearance of being really thick-skinned and robust and kind of resilient at times, but the only reason for that is because they're completely apathetic. They don't care about the things that we care about, right? Now, as believers, we don't, we're not apathetic like that. We have the love of Christ in us. If you're saved today, if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you have the love of Christ in you, or at least you have the capacity to have the love of Christ. And I believe, as, as believers, that makes us actually more sensitive. I think we are more sensitive than somebody that's not saved. Now, but having said that, we also have the capacity to be resilient, have that thick skin, because we've got the power of the Lord on our side. You think about that. We've got the power of the Lord with us. 
So even though, yeah, it's our job to love those that can't, you know, that are almost unlovable, you know, love your enemies, you know, bless those who persecute you, we have the capacity to do that through the Holy Spirit. But when that hardship and tribulation does come, because it will come, we shouldn't go into the flesh and try and manage it or try and avoid it, you know, avoid the confrontation, try and smooth things over, try and make things work, you know, uh, if it's the workplace or with family. Just be honest, just be truthful, but learn to develop that resilience and that thick skin so that when the persecution comes, when the false witnesses say what they're going to say, when they do what they're going to do, you're going to be able to cope with it. You're not going to go into a meltdown. But the reprobates, this is why they're apathetic. They have no feeling. Um, and right now I want to share something. And this goes back to, you know, about eight years ago. And this was a, a gentleman that used to go to my old church. And in fact, he was the best man at my wedding. He is a very different man today than what he was 21 years ago. But he was the best man at my wedding and he was a part of that church and he was traveling up here about eight years ago and he had a, a car accident in Gundawindi. I got a phone call at 2.30 in the morning where he'd, he'd crashed his car and he needed my help and I got up at 2.30 in the morning, drove all the way down to Gundawindi to get him from the hospital and bring him back up here. He was a friend of mine, he's the best man at my wedding. Like I, we'd been friends for a long time, we'd known each other quite well. And I drove him back up here and we put him up at our place. He was going through, um, he was in the process of going through a divorce with his wife at the time. And I'm thinking, oh, this is from the Lord. Here's my chance to get my friend saved. You know, give him the gospel, you know, because I knew what he believed was false because I once believed what he believed. He was trusting in his works. And I just saw this as a great opportunity to get him saved. But the Lord had other ideas. This man was never going to be saved because he's a reprobate. And I, me, a lot of my experiences since I got saved eight years ago have galvanised my belief in the Bible, like absolutely galvanised it. And this is one of those examples. And like, it's one thing, you know, to, you listen to your pastor preach up here or other men come up here and preach a sermon from the Word of God. And it's all true. It's all true. But when you experience things yourself that just line up with what's taught in here, it really galvanises what you believe. And this particular individual, I must have spent probably a couple of months trying to give him the gospel, trying to get him saved. I loved him. You know, he's my mate. He's my best man. And anyway, cut a long story short, it was futile. He wasn't receiving the gospel. He was rejecting it to the point where he was trying to convince me that what I was believing was false. And Callum, you've lost your way, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how you've fallen and all this sort of stuff. And while he's up here, he... After about a, a couple of weeks, he started treating Cindy, myself, the family in general, like garbage. Like, it was unbelievable. I'd driven down to Gundawindi, drove him back up here, helped him out, trying to get him on his feet. He's going through a divorce. He treated us like garbage. And not only that, while he's up here, I find out, right, and uh, to me, this is unbelievable. He's talking to me about how he go good he is, his good works, you know, he's boasting about the things that he does for the Lord, and that's, that's what you need to do to quote-unquote, be a disciple and really be saved. While he's up, and I'm going to share this because it's true and there's witnesses for this, while he's up here, he is in touch with one of the girls from down in that church and she's a married woman. He hooks up with her while he's up here, gets a hotel, commits adultery and then tries to pretend like he's some good guy. And it comes out, and, and what I find amazing, and look, God will forgive adulteries. He'll forgive fornication. He'll forgive all these sorts of thin, sins. But not for this man because he's reprobate. And I'm going to explain what characterises this particular individual as the reprobate. Because he knows what the gospel is. He knows the truth. But he, 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 he's ever learning without coming to the knowledge of that or an, and accepting that, that Jesus died for all of his sins. So he, he lies about how good he is. He commits this, this wicked sin. This is a married woman. Like, I knew her and I know she's married. I never met her husband. I've never met her husband. But, you know, they're both to blame for this sin. But what I want to point out here, and this is in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3. And when I talk about the Bible and what it teaches and how it galvanizes what we believe through the things that we experience in this life, 
Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And I know this is not an isolated incident from this guy because I found out later on about a lot of the things that he's done over the past 20 years. I was naive, ignorant, I had no idea. Like, but he's very different today than what he was 21 years ago, I'll say this, because he's now a reprobate. You know, more than 20 years in that church with what he believes has made him a reprobate. He is rejected by the Lord. He has a reprobate mind. He worms his way into, into women's homes laden with lusts this describes this guy to a T, like absolutely perfect. And I, it's a warning um, and, and Jesus says, you know, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Now, back then, eight years ago, I didn't fully understand the reprobate doctrine. I didn't get it. I didn't know, wasn't aware of what the Bible taught on this particular subject. Now I'm fully aware, but also those experiences just really galvanise what it teaches and in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, now this, this verse here, you've got to keep in mind, this is after Jesus is talking about, you know, do not judge lest ye be judged, right? Because he's teaching against hypocritical judgment in Matthew chapter 7. But in verse 6, he gives this warning. He says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. It's a warning. Now, you can't heed that warning without making that judgment, right? Without having that wisdom and being wise as the serpent, as Jesus advises and instructs us to do, you have to make a judgment. That means you have to understand these things that we're looking at. So when you see that individual that meets the characteristics of the reprobate, you can make that kind of judgment and go, oh, Jesus tells me not to give that which is holy unto the dogs. I'm not going to waste my time with this guy. See you later. From such, turn away. Jason's preached a good sermon on this in the past. From such, turn away. And it, it's important. This is super important because you don't needlessly need to allow yourself into situations where people like this can take advantage of you and potentially destroy your life. Right? Now, the harmless is dumb thing. I, I, it's not my job to try and rectify what this guy is doing. It's not my job to try and fix things here. But you know what it's my job to do? Turn away. From such turn away. And in Romans 8 verse 6 it says this, for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now we're still on the reprobate here. Now there's, there's a spectrum, you know, when it comes to the carnal mind there is a spectrum there where you've got the reprobate at one extreme end and then you've got other people that are not saved but all they have is the carnal mind and they, you, you can have some people that are right up the other end. They're not saved, they're not going to heaven, but they're nowhere near as bad as the reprobate. And, you know, along that spectrum, there are people that will get saved. Obviously, the reprobate that's right up this end of the carnal mind spectrum, he can't be saved. He's gone, he's lost. He's beyond redemption. But at that point, where that line, wherever that line is drawn and then that person hasn't become a reprobate, anywhere from there right up to the end of that spectrum, those people can be saved. They're the ones that we give the gospel to. You know, we give that which is holy unto those that can be saved, right? But this is, this back in the context of the sermon, talking about, you know, um, being resilient, developing a thick skin, the reprobate does have kind of an advantage in a way in the sense that because they have no feeling or, you know, that no conscience, they've got that kind of warped mind, they can be very, very resilient, which makes them dangerous, Right? Um, and we don't, we don't want to be spending any time with them. We want to avoid them from such turn away. But discuss, now here's the thing. I want us to have a look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. So there's that spectrum of the carnal mind. For us that are saved, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says this, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. What a verse. I love this verse. And, you know, 
there's the, the carnal mind. As a saved believer, we have the mind of Christ. We've got the access to the mind of Christ. We have that spiritual mind that we can, when we're walking in the Spirit, and it talks about power, love, and sound mind. And when it comes to being resilient, having a thick skin, this is where power comes into it. Think about it. We have that power that God has given us. Now, when it comes to power and resilience, I think of characters from the Bible like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. I think of characters like Joseph, Daniel. You know, these guys were put in certain circumstances and situations that required a lot of resilience, right? Now, how easy would it have been to be in that situation with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and sort of with a, you know, just lay doggo. (laughs) It's just not make a a point of not worshipping the statue and just trying to hide behind people and just not saying anything or trying to avoid people that might be aware of the fact that you're not going to bow down to the statue. No, they, they didn't care because they didn't care about pleasing men. And they, they, the consequences, they knew what the consequences were, but their resilience, their faith, that power that they have through, through God, that, that's what he's given us. He's given us this power. We see it on display in those guys. We see it on display. And that's something we ought to have in our lives, that same resilience, that same understanding. And the other thing about this too is love. Like we've got this love as well. We care about others. We should be tender-hearted, not like the reprobate. The reprobate that's apathetic, you know, we, we should be the complete opposite with our love. And it means that it's so important that we do have that wisdom, that, that, you know, that, why, that wisdom of the serpent as Jesus talks about, because we want to love, we have the Spirit, we really care about people, we want to see souls saved, we don't want them to go to hell, we've just got to be careful about who it is that we're loving exactly. Now, it's perfectly fine, in fact, it's commanded to love your enemies, but not God's enemies. And the reprobate is one of God's enemies, the haters of God. Jesus doesn't want us to mess with them at all, from such turn away. And of course, the sound mind, which is the mind of Christ, that we have. Now we're going to go back and, and look at Jesus again in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. I'm just reading one verse from Hebrews and then we'll be going back into Matthew 26. I hope my voice holds out. I've had this cold and I just cannot shake it. It just keeps coming back. So I hope I can get through this. Um, Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus, even though he's the Son of God, he's tempted, he was tempted in every way that we are in the flesh, obviously without sin. So he, he understands our infirmities. He understands our weaknesses. He understands the reasons why we fail at times and, and cave and, and give in. It's not an excuse, but he understands it because he was in the flesh in the same way that we're in the flesh, but without sin. And what we're going to look at here is in Matthew 26, because I think what can happen sometimes when we think about Jesus is we can, I think, and and I'm guilty, we can sometimes think he's just superhuman, that he doesn't go through the things that we go through. He's perfect, you know, he's always going to come through. He's just always going to succeed. And you know what? He will always succeed. But we can sort of think that he's superhuman because he's the son of God, right? Um, But no, he's tempted in every way that we are. And in Matthew 26, in verse 47, now we, the Bible reading was from Matthew 26, and it says, in verse, starting in verse 47, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, Wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Judas was Jesus' friend. Jesus had been with Judas for more than three and a half years, close to three and a half years. He considered, considered him a friend. Now, did this come as a shock to Jesus? No. This, it's not like Jesus was completely shocked and this came as a complete surprise that he was betrayed by Judas. He knew Judas. We know from the Last Supper that he knew that Judas was going to betray him. So it wasn't a shock. Now, that can be one of the differences. For us, these sorts of things can come as a bit of a shock to the system. 
if somebody close to us betrays us, sometimes we're not prepared for it because we're just not expecting it, right? But what, the point I want to make, though, he, he considered him his friend. Jesus, this would have hurt Jesus. He was his friend, in the same way that we have friends. I, I love the friendships that I have. They're important to me. And my list of friends is probably a little bit shorter today than what it was before I got saved, but that's a good thing. Um, that, that list needed to be trimmed, amen. And, and the Lord's helped me trim that list. But I just want to make that point, that he considered him a friend. And then let's have a look at what happens when he's betrayed, so after he's betrayed. Because surely the other 11, they're going to be on his side, right? They're not going to desert him and leave him. They're his friends, right? Verse 51, And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Oh, right, Peter's with Jesus. Now, this wasn't the right approach, was it? You know, so when Jesus says harmless as doves, do you think Peter was fulfilling that? Here? <laughs> of course not. Je Peter's, you know, he's pulled out the sword and he's taken matters into his own hands. This is not what we ought to do as believers. It was a moment of, you know, him being angry and defending his friend. 50, verse 52, then said Jesus unto him, put up again thy sword in, it, in his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are ye come out as against, uh, as against a thief with swords and staffs to t uh, for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and he laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Think about how Jesus might be feeling at this point. Right? He's taught in the temples. He's been teaching them. He's been performing miracles. He's been healing the sick. He's been feeding the poor and the hungry. He's been doing all these things. Everything was about doing things for everybody else. It wasn't about him or for himself. And you would have thought that maybe his close friends would stick with him. No. They've all deserted. They've all fled. And obviously when it comes to the resilience of Jesus Christ, it's always going to be perfect. He's got the thickest skin of anyone possible, right? But this is who we look up to, right? As believers, as children of God, this is something that we look at and we ought to prepare ourselves for situations like this. We know in the end times things are going to get so bad that brother will be betraying brother to death. Same as here. It's like betrayal or being deserted or being forsook by others. It's going to happen. We need a thick skin. We need to be resilient to prepare ourselves for this sort of stuff. Verse 57. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off under the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So even though you might have all your close friends desert you, leave you, betray you, whatever, sometimes you'll have that friend that will stick with you, but he'll do it silently in the background. You know, doesn't want to get in trouble, wants to avoid persecution and trouble, wants to save his own skin, right? We can be like that ourselves too. Right? Sometimes we can see our own friends in a lot of trouble or being pers heavily persecuted or... They need some support, love, help, assistance and nobody gives that assistance or support or, you know, there'll be certain pastors that might preach hard on something, for example, and it seems like nobody's really there to support them when they need them, you know, when they are being bombarded and smashed with persecution. But that's when they need it the most and we don't want to be that friend that sort of, you know, hides in the, the back corner somewhere just sort of watching on and this is where Peter finds himself right now. We ought not be this way. Verse 59, now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. So now we've got the false witnesses coming in. But found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none, at the last came two false witnesses. So they had all these false witnesses, but they just weren't prepared to really come forward and say what they were going to say. But they did find two. And in your <laughs> life... When it comes to persecution, hardship, people turning on you, saying false things about you, you're going to have false witnesses. You're going to have people who are going to say these things about you. And it can be difficult because sometimes they can be saying these things to other people that you love and care about, right? And they can be painting a false picture of you and you know it's false. But this is where this resilience comes in, right? This thick skin. 
And look, if they really are your friend, if they truly are your friend, do you think they're really going to believe the lies of the false witnesses? Probably not. And if they do, then it probably tells you what kind of friendship you've probably got with that particular individual. It's not great anyway. Go find some new friends. (laughs) But the false witnesses will come. And what I want to highlight here is Jesus' reaction or how he responds in verse 61 and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it with which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace. Jesus held his peace. Now, I I struggle with this. I'll be be the first to admit. Uh, This is something I really struggle with. When I've been wronged, if I've got false witnesses, people saying something wrong about me, or just misrepresenting me, I'm not holding my peace. (laughs) I'm I'm not, I'm going to be honest. Because at those times I'm in the flesh, right? My flesh reacts. I'm like, I've got to say this, this is false. I've got to say, I've got to let this person know or whatever it might be. Especially in the workplace, right? When you know that somebody's saying false things about you, it can be difficult. How do you hold your peace in that situation? It can be very, very difficult. But like I said, you know, the truth has a way of finding its, its way to the surface eventually. And it might not be immediate. It might not be straight away. Sometimes it might take some time. But eventually it will come to the surface at some point. And you might have to go through some hardships and, and tough times until that takes place. But we ought to be patient and we ought to be like Jesus, try and hold our peace and trust the Lord. Now... What I want to look at now is if we go to Luke 23. Luke 23. Oh, gee, I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to start. I've got to get moving. I'm definitely not going to get through all of this. I'm going to have to cut this short, and that's fine. Luke 23. What I might do here, I'll read verse 22, Luke 23, verse 22. And he said unto them the third time, What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Now, for some context, this is Pontius Pilate. He can't find any evil in Jesus and he just wants to let him go. And anyway, the people know they won't have it. They're not accepting it. They want to crucify him. And down in verse 28, Jesus says this, that Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. Now, wow, what a response, right? He's been betrayed, deserted, he's going to be crucified. He's not worried about himself. What's he, what? he's, he's like, don't, don't be sorry for me, don't weep for me, weep for yourself. Why? Because their ultimate end, if they haven't believed, is they're going to hell for eternity. And this ought to be our attitude, the same thing. Look, don't be a victim, don't be, feel sorry for yourself and get down when things get tough and hard and, people seem to be against you, we've got, we're saying we've got eternal life. We're going to heaven for eternity. Like, try and keep, the, you know, keep mindful of that when you're going through these tough times. Even Jesus, like, that's his attitude. This ought to be our motto. Don't weep for me, weep for yourself. You know, when you've got that guy at work that's giving you a hard time, it's like, I'm glad I'm not him. I'm glad I'm not that guy. Like, that should be our attitude. And look in verse 31, Jesus says this, right? For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? So Jesus is saying what he's going through right there and then is actually in a period of time where he would consider it to be like a green tree. And the context here, he's talking about end times. He's talking about how bad things are going to be in the future when it's a dry place. And the Bible talks about, you know, the greatest tribulation in the history of man is what believers are going to go through. And that's what he's saying. He's like, look, don't weep for me. It's cool. (laughs) Weep for yourselves. And in Psalm 69, we see this, uh, where the psalmist says, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head, that they that that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty, then I restore which which I took not away. You know, we have enemies that are wrongfully our enemies, and it's just the way it's going to be. It's just the way it is. You can't stop it. You can't change it. You're going to find it difficult trying to convince them otherwise sometimes. And it's just the way it is. And this is why it's important we be resilient. Have this thick skin. You are going to wrongfully have enemies. People that shouldn't be your enemies that will be. 
your enemies, when they wrongfully hate you. And we ought not to be people that just avoid confrontation because of that. Like, avoid all confrontation. It's, it's not the way to go. And a thick skin will enable you to be more confrontational. It can be awkward, be super difficult, but sometimes we need to be confrontational. And like I said earlier in the sermon, we don't deliberately look for it. It's not like we deliberately go and try and start a fight and be confrontational and, you know, wave the Bible in people's faces and that, that sort of confrontation. That's not what I'm talking about. But confrontational in being true and honest, sincere about what you believe. Um, and just quickly too, when I was looking for a good church all those years ago before New Life Baptist was founded, I had many encounters with false pastors, false teachers. I've got a little bit of a reputation on the coast. There's quite a few pastors that know who I am and they've said things about me that are not true. They have misrepresented me at times because they've got a false gospel. Remember I talked about how when somebody's invested in the wrong thing, when they misunderstand this and they're invested in, heavily invested in a false gospel, they will hate you. They'll hate you all the more. If you've got the right gospel, you're preaching the right gospel, it's just by faith in Jesus Christ alone, not of works, not turning from sin to be saved, you're going to have your haters out there. You'll have your detractors, people that will say wicked things about you. And we have an example in John 12, verse 42, of thin-skinned believers. Thin-skinned believers. John 12, 42. This was some of the Pharisees. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. So amongst the chief rulers, some of them believed on Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. If you love the praise of God and that's all you care about, you're, you're not going to care about trying to appease men. You're not going to water this down. You're not going to you know, try and polish it and make it look more appealing to people. And here you've got people that are so scared of these religious people, these Pharisees, that they hide themselves away. They don't want to be in the public. They don't want to be seen as being believers, right? For fear of persecution, for fear of persecution. Now, to try and wrap this up, I wanna, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff I had here. I didn't realise this was going to go so long. Um, one thing I do want to touch on quickly, if I can, is um, dealing with people's expectations. Dealing with people's expectations. In John 11, John chapter 11, verse 31. I'll try and get through this quickly. Uh, and this is... This is about Lazarus and we're all probably familiar with the story about Lazarus and his, his, res, his being raised from the dead. And in John 11 verse 31 it says, The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not de dead, like he wouldn't have died, right? Now, as, as believers, now we can't perform the miracles that Jesus can and can't do the things necessarily that Jesus did, but as believers, people in the world can sometimes have unrealistic expectations of us. It's like, look, if you'd have done this, this wouldn't have happened, or I thought you were a good Christian, you know, that kind of, so you're gonna, it's going to happen, right? And you're not always going to be able to meet the expectations of what people have on you in the world. And, you know, some people are going to make silly claims like they don't love Jesus or don't want to know about the Bible because of X, Y, Z that you did, right? All they're looking for is an excuse not to believe, really. They know you're a sinner. They know you're not perfect. But sometimes people can have unrealistic expectations. Now, here's the thing. If they've got these sorts of expectations on Jesus. Now, we know in an instant he can bring Lazarus back from the dead. But Mary's like, she's upset because he wasn't there. You know, well, Jesus was doing other things. <laughs> and when it comes to expectations, some people just have unrealistic expectations and you'll be busy just doing other things. And there'll be people in your life that you won't be able to please no matter what. So don't try, <laughs> all right? We're not here to please men, we're here to please the Lord. 
We don't want to be wasting our time with people that are just going to be critical of things that, you know, where they've just got unrealistic expectations. And in verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now, Jesus is crying here. Jesus is emotional. Je- we, you know what, Jesus is not devoid of emotion. He can cry. But what's he crying about? Is he crying because of something that's happened to him? Is he crying for himself? No, he's weeping because he's got compassion on the, these people. They've lost their loved one. They've lost Lazarus. And he loved Lazarus as well. And even in the next verse, verse 36, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. So they're, they're, they're making this statement. They're like, oh wow, he... He loves him, right? Now, of course, you know, Jesus has been mean to some of these people with some of the things he said. It wasn't mean, he was just speaking the truth. But they're like, oh, wow, he, he really loved Lazarus. He's crying. And look at verse 37. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? You'll always have your critics. There'll always be critics there, always. There'll always be the critics. And there's nothing you can do to stop that. It's, it's, it's going to happen in your life. It happened to Jesus. It's going to happen to us. And, you know, the Bible then in that particular passage, it does go on to teach that, that some of these men did believe. Right? And it's probably likely that the men that said, could not this man which have opened the eyes of the blind and have caused even this man that should not have died, they probably didn't believe. Right? We've all met those people that are like, you know, if there was a God, then this wouldn't have happened or he wouldn't allow this to happen or, you know, he wouldn't allow Lazarus to die. It's the same sort of thing, right? They just look for sort of any excuse not to, not to believe or to justify their own sins and the way they live and not to change their mind and believe on the Lord. They'll look for anything. Um, now, I want to finish the sermon with... Uh, some positive verses about why we should be able to have this resilience and this thick skin because remember I said earlier you know we've got the Lord on our side we've got access to his power through the spirit and in Isaiah sorry in Romans 8 chapter 8 verse 35 it says who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a powerful verse. Right. nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And um, this is why we ought to be resilient, why we should have a thick skin, because even if somebody's hating on you, you've got the love of the Lord. You've got the love of, the Christ, of Christ. What would you prefer? <laughs> now, we've just seen plenty, plenty of examples where you've got some men that prefer to please other men and, and have the praise and the love of other men. I know what I'd prefer to have. I'd rather have the love of the Lord. That's what I want. That's where the power is. That's where the love is. That's where the sound mind is. You can have that. <laughs> you know? Others can chase after the praise of men. It's a futile thing. In fact, the, like I said earlier, it's a cursing. Somebody that seeks after trusting in men or the praise of men or trying to please men, they live a cursed life according to the Bible. All right, let's finish there.